Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of All Ball Chicago. I'm your co-host, Robert Bobby Reed. I got the legend, the MVP veteran, Marcus Liberty, your host on the line. But we got a special guest in the building today. My man, one of the best power forwards in the NBA, all-time greatest DePaul legend, Chicago folklore. We love him. Terry Cummins in the building. What's up, TC? Everything, everything, Rob. How you doing? I'm doing just great, man. Marcus, man, he called me last night, man, like, I got TC. I'm like, let's go, Marcus, let's go. <laughs> man, yeah, it's, 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 it's great to have someone like Terry come on our show, man, because it is about Chicago, but we also have other special guests coming on. But Terry was one of the guys, man, I thought that coming out of Chicago was one of the quiet guys, but he always got the job done. I remember watching him play at DePaul. Uh, so I just wanted to have him on the show, man, so he can talk, enlighten us on some of the things that he did uh, growing up in Chicago. and. To where he's at now, doing some great things in uh, Atlanta, and uh, so Terry, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Who put the ball in your hands when you first started playing basketball in Chicago in the Roseland area? Uh, shoot, man, I I grew up. Uh, you know, my first couple sports were hockey and baseball. And shot. What? Yeah, hockey? man. Yeah, I was playing hockey uh, on roller skates during the summer and ice skates during the winter. <laughs> and then uh, we went from um, there. We played baseball all year round. I even I was playing baseball even when I was in the league. I was playing them weekend tournaments, you know, uh, uh, out in Texas and different places where they would have, you know, double elimination. You could play as long as you want. You kept mm -hmm. winning. And I was playing uh, third base, first base uh, in, uh, in the outfield. So uh, wow. but basketball came kind of like that, that year. I think we all had that growth spurt, most of us, you know, uh, six, six, eight and above. And mine was uh, between my freshman and my sophomore year. I grew from five, eight to six, four over the summer. It was about, about uh, uh, eight or nine inches. And I was in so much pain, didn't even know what was going on until I got home from my grandparents' home uh, house in uh, Hammond, Indiana. And um, by the time I got home, I was head and shoulders over everybody that I knew before I had left. And so the, the basketball thing came because of, you know, who you all were talking about when we, before we got online, Lee, uh, Lee uh, wanted to be the next Dr. J. And I mean, that joke of practice and he practiced and he practiced. And the only way um, I could get the ball is I had to go and, and literally, you know, get the rebounds for him, throw it back. And then over time I'd get a shot up and then eventually he'd get out there. He, he would wear me out, <laughs> get talk mess, he'd draw a crowd and be, running his mouth while he was doing it. And eventually I got to the point I was so hard uh, and had a chip on my shoulder uh, and I hadn't grown yet, but that summer I went and came back and we went back out on the court. It was all different, you know, cause I'd always had that chip and I'd always had that, that little piece of something that said, you know, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you for the rest of this game. We going to, this is the way it's going to go down, you know? And it right. wasn't about, you know, um, trying to hurt nobody was making a point. You know, if you okay. want to play with me, you got to play by my rules, you know, and part of that was that physicality, you know, all the young cats would come into the league, all the buff boys, and uh, they would run straight at T. And um, so I would tell them after they, you know, bounce off you one time, hitting you and swell up and say, what, what, what? I tell them, I say, young fella, we're going to do this for 48 minutes. I said, you ain't, ain't a one punch fight here. <laughs> you know, and so by the time the game was over, them jokers sitting on the sideline, tied out, and I'm sitting up there. You know, I got all kind of energy. I do this for a living, right? You know, but my brother Lee actually put the ball in my hand. I told him that uh, some years ago that if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have had the uh, desire to play basketball. I was I was going to be good at whatever I did because I was really tenacious and, and aggressive about my practice times and putting my heart soul into stuff. But he gave me an edge that only a big brother could give to a little brother. And that was, you know, by the time I got to college or even to high school to play on high school level, I was playing against pros in the pro-am at 16, 17 years old. So by the time I got to my junior year, I only played two years of high school. I already knew nobody could play me. Wow. wow. And I remember years. Lee, man. Lee had the big hands, man. He used mm -hmm. to dominate, dude, and he was yeah, but, 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 what, but, but what, like, mind boggles me a little bit that you only 
played two years of high school basketball. Well, my junior, my freshman, my sophomore year, well, my freshman year, I was at Harlan. They cut us in the first meet. Daryl Daryl Walker was in that group too. They Y'all put us good? on the court, ran us on, and ran us off. You know, because they had to get the tryouts in. Um, and then I transferred from there, went to night school at Carver my sophomore year and wound up going to Carver, but the coach wouldn't play me because he had juniors and seniors. So I didn't play until my junior year. And by the t- my junior year, I might have averaged about 25, 26 points, you know, oh. 16, 17 boards, you know. And, and that was just straight out of Pro-Am because when I came out of the Pro-Am, that year, the Pro-Am was the year, it was either my junior year or my senior year, Dave Corzine went to the Pro-Am, and Dave was in the game, and I, I think uh, it was at uh, Chicago State. Right. And uh-huh. um, I had a game against Corzine. I think I scored about 60 or 70 points. He didn't show up no more. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, back then, Marcus, the Pro-Am was all about getting your name. It was about, you know, it was one thing if, if you were a rumor. And since I, I didn't go to none of the BC camps or five-star camps, I mean, the only camp I went to was Forrest, uh, uh, what was my man's name? Um, he just passed. Oh, Forrest. I know you're talking about Forrest. I went to Forrest yeah, did a lot of stuff. Education uh, camp. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went to Forrest. Uh, his, Forrest Harris. Yeah, he's he was the only that was the only camp I went to in my whole high school career. And um wow. and, and because I was what they called a blue chip was somebody nobody really knew about. And I came on the set and um I made a name for myself. But a lot of that I I, I give, you know, first of all, give God all the glory and credit for it. And also my brother, because he made me hard. Because by the time I got there, I wasn't afraid of nobody. You know, I was the dude setting precedents. You know, I was the dude. I mean, I got my name before I could even play, you know, because I had a chip on my shoulder when I played. I remember we played against Lynn Bloom in a a scrimmage game. And I had just come straight off the streets. and, And I was in my sophomore year. And um and and Coach Horace Howard, our coach, was teaching us how to slide and deny, slide and deny. Yeah. Well, they had a cat named Whitehead, I think. He was their their senior on the team. This joker was popping me in the chest and in the face with his elbow every time I would slide up. And I would look at the coach because, you know, I knew what to do streetwise. Right. But I was trying <laughs> to act like I had some sense. And so the coach <laughs> kept looking me off. And uh, so finally, after he hit me one time too many, I tapped him on the shoulder and knocked him out. I knocked him straight <laughs> out at, at the top of the free throw line, and the coach, they canceled every <laughs> thing. But that was the beginning of the, that, that TC legacy, and it was really about the toughness more than it was about the balling. But most cats that were tough didn't have balling skills, and I had both. And it came from having to fight my brother all the time. Wow. wow. And, and also, TC, what I remember when I watched you play, man, I, and, I, and I say this to people all the time, your fundamentals, man, your skills and the way you used to crab dribble into the middle and then spin out and shoot that bank shot, you know, fadeaway bank shot, man. I, I patterned my, my game a little bit after you, man, by watching you. I know you probably didn't know I was watching you when I was playing on them pro-am games with you, but I used to watch you, man, do some things out there and your fundamentals was off the charts. Well, it was all that drilling, man, because um, I promise you, man, from uh, hanging with my brother Lee, uh, I picked up really good practice habits, even though he wasn't a practice player, but he would hmm. work on his game. You know, he he would work on his game before practice. And, and I mean, hours, we would get up early in the morning and go out to the, the only time we left the courts was to go home and eat, change clothes and come back. Cause you know, the real ballers came out at about four or five o'clock and then you had real games. That's right. And, and uh, we would have men out at Scanlon, out in Roseland, Man, kids, family, they would come out, sat out on the porch, barbecue, sitting on the on the uh on the um mobile porch. homes, the mobile mm-hmm. school things, and mm-hmm. I mean all up on the park. I mean, we would have them lined up and cats would be coming from all over the city to come to our park to play. And then we would go to all the joints around the city to play. Cause back in, you know, 70s and 80s, man, you had cats who may not have had gone to college or may not have stayed in high school long, but they were straight ballers. I mean, I mean, cats on the street, 99th uh, parks, just out on the parks. I would go, man. I'd go out there. My boys would be like, man, you can't be going out here. You know, the gangster disciples over here and the vice lords right. over here. But they always respected back in the day if you stayed in your lane. Right. If you came to ball, ball, 
Don't do all this extra stuff. Just come on and ball. And you know, you can't go out there showing yourself soft because if you do, you won't get you won't get what you think you're gonna get. You're gonna get something else. Right. That, that's what I was telling Lib uh, when you used to come to our park on 99th and Princeton. Mm -hmm. As soon as you pull up, you be like, man, go get that boy Nate. You remember Big Nate? Yeah. They played yeah. in Syria. Yeah. And yeah. it was like like, like watching Eliza Wine and, and Ralph Sampson, uh, uh, Mark, is watching these two big dudes out there. And then y'all had yeah. a great quality of hoopers, man, back then. Oh, like, yeah. It has Everywhere. fallen off drastically. And what do you yeah. attribute that to? What do you think that is? Why has it fallen off? Because y'all gave us a reason to dream. Right, Lib? No, no doubt. No doubt. Well, I, I think the biggest thing is um, the love of the game, man. I mean, cats. Whether you was pro or not, you would be. You could be a pro in your neighborhood. You was a pro legend in your neighborhood, and that was just as much love as a cat like me going from the neighborhood to that DePaul and then to the NBA. Because kids in your neighborhood said, "Well, I want you know, for instance, Big Nate. I want to see what Big Nate could do against TC." You know, and mm -hmm. and we would go at it. It wasn't like you know, you ultra dominate. You gonna get. You gonna have to compete. Right. And uh, I tore my knee up playing out at uh. Ate apart. Um, the cat fell into it, and I'd had three, four, three hundred pound cats fall into my knee. Not even the twins. It was just that time, you know. But I would go out to Ate Park. Ate Park had cats out there, man. That we would go, we would go at it, you what know. You and what you think a Mac could do from up there? Park for it, huh? What you think a Mac could do from Ate Park? Well, you know Mac was was the main. Me and Mac would go at it. Me and Mac were the main cats. Mac could play. I told Mac you, that boy Mac was cold, wasn't he, man? Yeah, he was kind of symptomatic to, of a lot of the guys who just uh, either they did they weren't in the in the right realm, didn't get the right chance or opportunity, but it wasn't because they couldn't play, right? You know, but which shows you too that you know another piece of the puzzle to your question is that it ain't all about basketball, right? You, know, you, you right. got to carry you got to carry the whole torch, and then you know one of the other things that was prevalent for us, Marcus, uh, in our day, was we knew coming out of school, high school, we represented our whole community and right. we were taking them on our shoulders and, uh, and these cats don't get that. And mm -hmm. it's not to, and, and, and let me be clear, this is not, I'm not against the, this generation of players. This is their time and their season. This is their style of game and they're playing the way they play. So exactly. it's just that that difference was we would have been the moral equivalency of uh, the group that came out with civil rights and, and they would be the group that benefited from it and don't know the value of it. Right. Mm -hmm. I got Excellent. you on that. And, and also, Terry, man, I, I always say this too, man. Like, <clears throat> I know when I played, not only did I represent my hood, but I represented my family. Absolutely. You know? so, so my grandmother, who was a church going lady, she would pick me up. Uh, of all of us, all of us siblings on Friday after school, and we would go to her house getting ready for church on, on Saturday and Sunday. You That's know, right. cleaning on Saturdays, the cooking and all that, and, and serving the community. She had me doing that. So she instilled a lot in me, you know, and that's who helped me become who I am today. So I know your grandmother probably did the same thing, or grandfather. Well, yeah, mom. Beat us in the church, boy. We was in church eight days a week. Me too, you know, man. And, uh, <laughs> my mom, you know, fortunately, when I got to be about 13 years old, my mom allowed us to make our own choice of a decision as to what we would, we would do. And so between the year, my early years and the 16, I just got into all kind of stuff. And then I, I became, I got saved at uh, 16 and I called to the ministry. I've been in ministry ever since. But those things didn't slow down the edge because they just added to it because I had, you know, a button I could push if I was going too far, you know, right. with, with the Lord, you know, and, um, and it wasn't about church. It was like really just having a relationship with God and understanding what that meant, you know, because uh, for me, uh, basketball was never, and it would never take and could never take the place of God in my life. But it was a joy for me to play. I, I, I love playing. I, I even wonder why now I won't even hardly Touch a ball. You don't touch um, it. It, it. Yeah, but if I get on the court, uh, my son, my youngest son, Sean, he'll he'll get on the court. He said, I want y'all to watch this. Now, he ain't touched the ball in about a year to watch him now. And Joe will go up to the three-point line and start drilling him. I said, <laughs> well, how can you do that if you ain't touched the ball? I said, it's just science. Right. <laughs> said, Somebody got muscle memory for this. No matter where I am on the court, 
you know, the muscle memory is there. You know, you line it up, you know, you got your, you, you know, your, 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 follow. your triangle, you know, and you shoot <laughs> down the middle. It's, 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 it's all science, you know? <laughs> And why you in good always, shape, though, man. You huh? in shape, dude. I see you out walking and everything, man. You still oh, yeah, I do that. You got, to, you got to do the least you could do, you know? Yeah, yeah but Marcus, man, I wanted to say, too, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of you, man, because I followed your career, and I'm not blowing smoke. You know, you've been a man of integrity, and, and you, your balling skills, man, was on point. You know, I think that uh, it was unfortunate for a lot of us that came out of Chicago. We were not were not always given the opportunity to really show our full skill level, and a lot of times it was because it was because most people were intimidated by just the fact that we came from shy. You wow. know, mm -hmm. and you know, and that that was a, a thing, man. I used to just sit back and watch you, and um, you had your skill level, man, was like. Uh, it was a lot of cats that played at that position, but you had an extra advantage because you could play that, you know, you literally two, three, four, right. and some five, two. And then in our business in the league, that that put you at, at an advantage when it came to things, but you still had to have that door open by the right, right person, you know? Right, but I appreciate I, I, that. Yeah, I think sometimes the, the worst thing and the best thing that happens for some of us is like when I retired, I stepped away from the league and uh, people talk about you in a in a third person way, like you didn't do nothing. You was, yeah, and they yeah. only got to see me play, you know, the last five, six years of my career. And I, and I have to remind myself, you know, I wouldn't that do that, you, you know, you, you know, that I played, you know, I accepted my role now as a role player and, and until you do, you can't be co considered a complete player. You know, right. no matter what stage you are in your career, you know, you have to be able to accept your role. And then your peers are your greatest testament. It's not it's not these jokers on these- uh, Social media uh, and all of that stuff. stuff. Like that. Yeah, throwing up stuff like, you know, Marcus Liberty and, uh, and being who, who was the best. Yeah. Who, don't nobody, who cares? Exactly. Because, first of all, I have a love for ballers, period. Uh, and, and I think when you grew up in the league, and you like I did, I played with the best players that ever played at one time in the yes, history of the NBA. And so when I set up and watch these these blogs and these people going at it talking about, you know, Magic or Isaiah or Kareem or uh, uh, Moses, it's like they ain't got a clue because I played against them cats. Them cats, in their own right, they were the best at what they did. And all of them did something differently from the, the, each other, even though they may have played the same positions, you know? And uh, unfortunately, the nature of the NBA ain't no different than the nature of society. They choose uh, who are gonna be their favorites. If you pay attention to what's going on in all these pro sports, they'll tell you at the beginning of the season who they push, who they want to be MVP, who's gonna be rookie of the year, Who's going to be in the final? Who, who, who are their choices? And this ain't no conspiracy theory. This coming from an 18-year vet that could have told you then. Right. There's a reason why, you know, I played on really good teams in Milwaukee and San Antonio, but we, we didn't get that, that push to, that would have allowed us to go to that next level. And it wasn't like they were doing us a favor. All they had to do was call the game fair. Uh -huh. You know, if you call the game fair, then I, I I got opportunities because I know if I get to the championship, I'm winning. Right. I already right. know that. But they're not going to let everybody get in. And it's not a conspiracy theory. Let me say that. It's just a matter of politics and money. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Which I'm which leads, uh, leads, leads me to the next question. Uh, which leads me to the next question, Terry. Yeah, and that was a good point that you just did, too. Um, what... What kind of helped you make that decision to stay home? You know, I know you probably were being recruited by a lot of top colleges, or were you recruited by a lot of All top of colleges? Every college. So what made you stay, you know, to DePaul, go to DePaul, which was Chicago's team? Everybody wanted to watch right. Chicago. Chicago Blue Demons. They wanted to be like, you know, Mark Aguirre, you, uh, all those great guys that came from Chicago, Teddy Grubbs. Everybody wanted to watch DePaul back then because is that one of the reasons why you chose DePaul? Was it because of Mark Aguirre? You and Mark Aguirre had a relationship. What, what was one of the reasons why you, you stayed home? Wait, uh, funny thing is, I had gone to Iowa. Lou Olson was there. And uh, Ronnie Lester was, was his man. Ronnie was the man on campus at University of Iowa, and Ronnie was a bad boy. 
That's you what know, I heard. Smaller. He I heard he used to eat Isaiah Thomas up. Oh, yeah, Ronnie, because Ronnie was built more like a fullback. I mean, oh. he had calves, like, uh, you know, watching some of the big fullback running backs in, in the NFL. Ronnie uh -huh. was built like that, but he was quick. You know, he was really quick. He got off the ground. Really, he was like a Ricky Green type that could, you know, stop on the dime Ooh. and uh, had great penetration skills, was a really good defender and was tough. But I went down there – and Ronnie uh, was uh, – back then they would allow the players to bring uh, other cats in and, you know, you could recruit for the school. Wow. So, uh, uh, Ronnie was taking me around, and I said, well, I like all this and everything, you know, took me to Luke's house. The wife cooked, and the food looked like black food but didn't taste like it. And, and then it was uh, – <laughs> it, was, uh, it wasn't a whole bunch of us on campus. So I pulled Ronnie aside. I said, Ronnie, I like all this. I said, but, man, where are the black folk? He said, Tia, he, this it. There ain't going to be a whole bunch of black people. I said, okay, I got what you need then. And right. so I – I went back home and I, I was supposed to go to UNLB uh, and talk. We had uh, set up something, but before I did, I decided I would check out DePaul and Loyola. And uh, Loyola was the, uh, was, I never got to, uh, what got me to DePaul was Ray Meyer. And then, and then DePaul didn't recruit me because my coach didn't like them, so they couldn't get through. So I had to call and recruit myself to DePaul. Wow. I made the call, asked them how come they hadn't called. They said, well, we had, but your coach wouldn't let us get through. So I said, well, I'm coming down to the campus. Y'all can show me around. And I sat down for hours and just chatted with Ray. And that was what sold me because I had not really met Mark. I only okay. knew Mark from the Pro-Am. Right. And I knew that Mark and, his, and Westinghouse was getting all the love all over the city. And it would have been great. I wanted to play with him. Um, and we, we just, you know, one thing led to another. Uh, I got to DePaul, and, and it was all it was all gravy after that because it was just like, you know, I knew how to work. I knew how to follow instructions, and I was the dude on the team. I think either my freshman or sophomore, probably my sophomore year, I wound up being the captain of the team, and that's with Mark on the team. But but that was because of the, the level of rapport and, and the reputation that I was carrying at the time, you know, right. coming to school. But uh, – it that that's how that's how that all rolled out at DePaul, but it it was in my favor. It would have been because again, Marcus, I didn't have the uh, pedigree that Mark had or, or any of those other cats. They went to all those camps. I kind of snuck up in there. I mean, think about it. I played two years of high school, and I only played three years of college. And then I come and win the rookie of the year on a team that went that loses fifty something out of eighty something games. Wait, 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 TC. Wait, wait, wait. wait. You played only two years of high school. You mm -hmm. wasn't a McDonald's All-American or any of that, right? No. All right. I so was never you, an All-American in high school. Only you honorable did your thing. You, you did your thing in college, three mm -hmm. years, yeah. and then you was, what, number two player taken number in the draft, two, right? Yeah, yeah. Who went before on, you? Man, if that's, if uh, that's not if that's not, if that's not hope for kids, man, who think they need to get all the hype and, and yeah, get all the stuff, no. the accolades and all that Being stuff. Being under the radar is a blessing, man. You know, because when you step up in there, you the you the you the dude or the or you the guy or the girl in our society now that everybody's looking for that that hidden gem. And you know, for me at six nine, I was running point guard. You know, like yourself. I mean, I that that was a another uh, gift that I had because I had I played with these cats who wouldn't throw the ball in the post. So I had to learn how to do dribble skills. You know, behind the back, left, right. You know, cross. So we do all that stuff, you know, step back before they start talking about it like it's something new. We've been right. doing this stuff for years. You know, I would take my sons out and they'd be doing all these dribbling things just to get a shot off. I said, let me show you something that'll work in a second. I said, this is all you need. And I just do that little step back and pop. You know, I said, That's, it's just that simple. I'm sitting down and I can still do it. Right. And, and it still works because the doko still start moving, you know. But it's just that the, the game is simple is simpler than they made it to be and I think uh, if I if I move over a little bit and uh, kind of sidebar Go ahead. this game is 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 not something I haven't seen the game that the NBA plays now is the game I played in Milwaukee with Don Nelson and it's the game that Don Nelson played in Golden State he taught his guys mm -hmm. and now it's become the whole emphasis of the league drawing kick 
That's all it is. That's it. And you don't you don't have guys that want to go down in that blood at work because you go down there, you get bloody. It's it's really a, a real man's work down there. And wow. I loved it. I thought it was the bum. I didn't feel like it was right till I was getting hit so I could let them feel me, you know? That's classic, That's though. Oh, well, yeah. That's facts, man. Mm -hmm. That's facts. Go ahead, Rob. You got something you want to ask? You know, I was just, I was just enjoying it so much, man. Because, like, well, I mean, how do you think you would fare right now in the league, TC? You think you could fit into this game now that they playing? How would you play yeah. right now? Yeah, yeah. It just, I would probably be. I think if you take a guy from the '80s and '90s and put him into this, this, uh, this dispensation of players, they would change the way the game is played. And the reason for it, if you took them with all the knowledge and ability they have in the 80s and 90s and placed them in this decade, they would change the game back to 80s and 90s. Because if you just take one piece apart, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's a piece apart that knows what it's doing. Right. You know, because for me, mine was the work ethic, the professionalism. Uh, it was making sure that uh, when I got on the court, Horace Howard in high school taught me, if you, you're going to be the biggest guy on the court through high school, uh, so you have to use two fouls every game. Uh, one is putting the little guy that likes to drive on the floor, and the second one is making sure that the toughest guy on the other team know that you are the toughest guy on the floor. Wow. And I, all, I took that with me for years, because I don't just use it in basketball. I use it in business, I use it in ministry, I use it in everything I do. I got two things I'm gonna do to somebody to make sure I got their attention and captivate them. And then from then on, we're gonna be all right. That's, That's knowledge right there. That's, That's dropping real. knowledge right there. That's real, man. I tell my sons that, like, they think basketball just, oh, I could just go out here and shake and bake. I'm like, dude, this thing is a teacher of life. Yeah. Oh, you know, and it carries over to your adult life and the way that you play the game and Prepare yourself. That's how your life would end up, you know, transpiring in the long run. So if you half-ass and do stuff this way, that's how it's going to be, you know, so. Yeah, come back the way you get what you, you get out, what you put in. And that's a real that's fact, nice. man. That is real. We got yeah, 10 right. minutes left, Lib. Are we going to need two parts with TC, man? Because I don't want to miss nothing with this man, man. man. And, and you know what? I think Terry, I think Terry covered a lot of stuff, man, that I really wanted to hear as far as, you know, the knowledge of someone like himself who didn't get all the, the accolades and the, all the publicity that you see all these elite athletes today. So that's one reason why we wanted to start All Ball Chicago is to, to drop some knowledge to the younger generation so we can help them become better, not just getting on social media. We're cool with that, but trying to get as many likes as you want, you know, so you can mm -hmm. think you're popular and all that. We just wanted to try to drop some knowledge, man, and I think TC covered a lot of that, man, with, on today's show. Can I, can I say one other thing? Go ahead. Um, one of the things that helped me transition from thinking that I had to be a part of the, the uh, elite uh, mindset of, you know, I got to be in the all-star games. I got to be all pro. I got to win MVP. Was um, I was putting up those kind of numbers for the first 10 years of my, my career. And I only made two all-star teams, but never got on the first team. And, um, and there was no reason for me not to, because uh, the numbers before spoke. there was a Charles Barkley, before there was a Carl Malone, there was Terry Cummins. He was the prototype. Yep, Small right. four, big four. Right. And so, and then he was balling against the best cats that, that ever played at one time, right. you know? Right. And so, so when I came to it, I, I thought to myself about it, prayed about it. I said, it has to be enough for me to know how good I am and how consistent I am and that I cannot measure that by a system that's already broken because it's based on favoritism and politics. And it gave me the opportunity not to shortchange myself, but not, I always said, people said, well, how could you not make the, the all-star team, your numbers and your teams and woo, woo, woo. And I said, that stuff don't matter to me no more. I said, cause I realized that's fixed. All I got to just go out here and do my job, you know, because my greatest level of respect comes from the guys who make it knowing that I ain't there, uh -huh. you know, and uh -huh. I belong there, you know. So over the course of my career, you know, I've, I've had, uh, and I'm sure Marcus the same way, because we who are consistent and we, and we silent, silently do what we do, we don't get the love of the people who create the ruckus. Yep. I mean, if they got mess going on and all that, that stuff is, is good for them, but that's not the life I want to live. You know, I came from the streets, 
uh, uh, lived on the north side down the street from Cabrini Green, then moved out south to the Roseland area. I saw enough death and enough stuff that, that it kept me focused, you know, knew I wasn't going that way and that I was going to do something different. And I wanted to be, you know, a light to people, something that was a strength to the young brothers, especially, wow. you know, because we did a camp that. at uh, Carver for 23 years, you know, wow. that I paid for myself. Wow, wow. Yeah. man, GC. Because I wanted awesome. the kids to have their own thing, you know. That's awesome. It's awesome, brother. We just so don't we have don't, guys like, like TC, man, no more, man. Oh, but we're going to finish up with this, man. TC, let everybody know what you're doing now. Uh, I know you got a ministry, man, and, and doing your thing with, with that. But let everybody know what you're doing now and, and, and maybe how can they find you if they want to join. Uh, I know you do some online classes and, uh, about your ministry and all. So let them, let them know. Let the people know. Yeah, we on Facebook Live. We've been on for, for quite a few years. I do a lot of teaching. Um, I have a, a doctorate in divinity. Um, but that ain't why I teach. I teach because I love to teach. You know, I've always been you know, strategic in that regard. But I've been in uh, pastor in this church here in uh, Georgia, Stone Mountain, Georgia, for 12 years. Hope Eat Your Needle Ministries International. We do food outreaches. Uh, um, we, I teach and train leaders to lead. You know, that's what I do. You know, I take the time to break it down, keep it simple, um, but make sure that it's not uh, colored um, by the provisional pop political scene that we're in now, but that it stays pure. You give people things the way God gave them to you, and mm -hmm. you don't add yourself to them in the sense that you color you into it so that they have more respect for you than they do God, oh. you know? So um, I take the time to do that and which still I've been in the music industry as well since 8045 and <clears throat> we do music and we write for a lot of people I'm an artist a player producer um, wow. been on keys you know for for quite a while play a little bass a little acoustic and um you know just I mean the love of what I do I, is the one of the things to me uh well let me get the information the the church information is in Stone Mountain Georgia uh, we're at 5405 Memorial Drive in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Or you can reach us at hemi.church, H-E-M-I dot church, H -E -M -I .church uh, on the website. Um, and, you know, we just, we do what I love. I mean, it's just a, a figment of me. I go under the radar, just like I always have. I just, wow. I ain't necessarily looking for pe people to blow my horn. I just want to get the work done. And that's always been my thing. One of my my friends uh, back at San Antonio, uh, Luke, uh, Kimball used to say, said, what I like about TC is TC put on his hard hat and he just go to work. That's what he do. He just going to come right. in and if you get in his way, he going to move you. You're going to get you know? punished. And, and that's really kind of the thing. Yeah, you got to pay to play here. Wow. Still. Wow. That, you know? That's, man, that's how you got to end the show right there, man. TC, man, we love you, man. And then, I'm sorry, Marcus, you wasn't from the Rosen area, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we we from Chicago. See, and that's what I just messing with you, man. I just we can talk about you, man. we can talk about that another time, but that's what <laughs> I don't like about Chicago. We divide the city, man. Right. It's south side, west side, you know. Yeah, I think man, I'm, I'm that's been Chicago. us though. That's been yeah. they that's always been it. You know, they never really gave the love to the South Side ballers. Right. They almost always went to the West Side ballers. As yep. though that we could ball, but the truth is, is uh, you know that red, that red South, you know, brought a bunch of great players. You know, a lot of us came out of that, and even when I didn't even, you know, I didn't have a clue about how all of this hierarchy worked when I came through. Because, like I said, I didn't came, I didn't come up playing ball. So when I came through, I was learning everything as I went. I didn't know the value of things. I didn't understand the value of making the playoffs, winning championships, although we would win them all the time outside of uh, organized sports. But then when I got into the organized, I didn't really get the value till I got to college and got to the pro level and realized a lot of cats quit on you. Wow. I mean, they, they, they you know, guys at the end of their careers on the pro level, they just collecting the check on the collegiate level. They want to get to the pro level. So it's all about them, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a different thing, the schematics. Wow. All right, Terry, 30 seconds, man. What advice would you give to a young kid right now? 30 seconds. Put your time in, you know, get your education, you know, keep a God 
focus, be balanced across the board. Don't have one piece or part that's greater than the other and assure yourself your future by at least understanding who you are and you're now. Man, Terry, I love right. you, my man. man. I love you, T. I really appreciate you. Man, man thanks for coming on the show, man. Love you, TC. Appreciate man. you, Marcus, man, for always bringing the heat, big dog. Man, we had another edition of All Ball Chicago, man, on Believe Podcast Network. TC go come back and join us, man, because this wasn't enough time. So we'll be back again Tuesday and Thursday. Check us out and check this um, check this one out, too, um, uh, Thursday. We're going to drop this Thursday. Thanks again for coming on, TC. Marcus Liberty, we out of here, big baby. What you finna do, Liv? It's time for me to unlace the shoes, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, TC. Peace, big baby. All right, man. Peace, How you been? All right, peace. guys.